There is a bomb in Gilead to heal our sin-sick soul, to know then that we're not spinning our wheels as we go through this life, but that we have purpose, we have aim. And uh, what a joy it is to know then that we can be fellow workers with our Lord and fellow workers with one another. Uh, and so consequently that puts a spring in our step and uh, because of aspiration within our hearts that we have of the life that is now but also the life that is yet to come. I thank you so very, very much for your acts of kindness shown to me. Those of you that have taken me out for meals and for those who have had me in your homes, uh, I genuinely appreciate it and it has just been all good. It's, it's just been great. And so I, uh, I, uh, I want you to know I, I do appreciate that and I don't just say it because it's something that ought to be said. I genuinely uh, do mean it and I thank you. I'm so grateful for this good eldership and this good membership and the work that you're trying to accomplish in the kingdom of God and what you're doing and you're just doing a good work and just keep on keeping on from what I've seen uh, from being around you you have a lot of talent in this congregation and you love one another and uh, you know Satan has a hard time getting in when that is the case if you stand for the truth and you love one another uh, well then Satan has a hard time uh, getting in I appreciate brother Bob and the great work that he does in proclaiming the gospel of Christ, the good work that he and his good wife do in this congregation and how that uh, you love them. And I believe uh, I've heard it said that one of the young children said, well, who is this Bob that's in the pulpit? <laughs> I think that's a great compliment to him uh, that somebody, when they get into the pulpit, that must be a Bob, you know, because Bob's the preacher. And so, uh, we, we rejoice in that. I hope that the sermons then have been edifying unto you and uh, just look forward, Lord willing, maybe being with you again someday. Also, we want to invite you to come over to Memphis, Tennessee, and we'll take you out in one of those barbecue places over there if you can eat our type of barbecue. Now, I won't take you to the Carolinas. Somebody here, you may like that barbecue, but you know they, they mess up some good barbecue in the Carolinas, in my opinion. But... Uh, they, they, uh, they have a different kind. My wife and I were over in Carolinas one time and I think maybe I was preaching a meeting and they said, we're going to have barbecue tomorrow. We were excited about it. And when they spread out the table, we couldn't find the barbecue. <laughs> we thought it was coleslaw or something. You know, it looked all different. Well, but actually, I guess if you grew up on that, you might like it. And, and a lot of people who didn't, I guess, like it. But uh, I guess that's what makes the world go round. Not everybody can like Memphis barbecue, I guess. But anyway, we would invite you to come and we'll, uh, we'll treat you nicely. We have a lectureship coming up, as always, the last uh, full week in March. And we have RV hookups. You can, if you have an RV, wanna drive it over to there. We have everything there that you would need for that RV. And uh, we don't charge you anything for rent. It's all free for nothing. And so, of course, you get what you pay for sometimes, I guess. But uh, we would uh, just be glad for you to come. There's sometimes between 700 to 1,000 people who come. And so we put, as Brother Curtis Cakes would say, we put the little pot in the big pot and we have a good time. He'd always say that. I don't know what that meant, but it sounded good if you put the little pot in the big pot. But anyway, I think that's just a southern way of saying we'll, we will uh, show you some hospitality. And so I'd like to solicit your prayers, uh, not only for the travels that I do here in the States and the work that I do at the Memphis School of Preaching, but I've uh, been doing some mission work since about 1992. And uh, here in the last few years, I've been traveling over to the Far East. It's uh, my privilege to work with Four Seas Bible College in Singapore, where we bring in people from Vietnam, from Laos, from Cambodia, not Cambodia, but uh, Philippines, Malaysia. In fact, we have people now graduating 19. We, we're in 19 different countries over there. So I travel to Singapore. I leave on November the 16th for that. And that's a fur piece. If, uh, that means that's a long ways. 
Yeah, over there, it's, it's located about right there on the other side of the world, in other words. And then I will leave there and go into China. And as you know, China is a communist country. Consequently, we're not allowed to openly teach and preach. And so if we do have any meetings there, as far as any teaching or preaching, it would have to be behind closed doors. And so we're going back over uh, there. Not, uh, and this be my, I don't know how many trips into China. But anyway, if it ever opens up, uh, we've got men who are trained from Four Seas Bible College that are there now. And so we'll be traveling there, and I'll be traveling back home on December the 5th. And so I would certainly appreciate your prayers. We're so grateful that you are visiting with us this evening. Those that are from the community also, we are so glad that you're here. And we hope that you've brought your Bibles and that you will open up the Word of God with us this evening. In fact, I invite all of you now to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 14, or Mark chapter 13, really. Mark chapter 13. As we think about the mission of the church, Mark chapter 13, and in this chapter is actually talking about Christ coming, and he gives a parable or a, of sort here. He says in verse 34, Mark 13, 34, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey, who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work, and commanded the porter to watch. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not when the master of the house cometh, at even, or at midnight, or at the cock crowing, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. The church of Christ has a work to accomplish. In our text here, we find that the Lord says that it's like the Son of Man who has he's left his house in the care of someone and that he's commanded him and all of his servants, each one of them a work to do. Notice that each one has a work to do. When a person becomes a member of the Lord's church, he or she needs to find his work or her work in the kingdom of God. I'm afraid that many times we've likened faithfulness to just attendance. We say someone is faithful if he or she attends every service, and that is a prerequisite, of course, of being faithful. But there's much more to being faithful than just our attendance in worship service. There is a work that God expects the church to do. Among active churches and obedient churches, that's easier to do. If you become a member of an active congregation, you'll soon be finding some work for you to do because everybody is at work. Don't be like the church that a preacher friend of mine told me, an older man now, but I asked him about a particular church. He said, well, they make mistakes over there, but they don't do it in a hurry. <laughs> now what he meant by that was is that they just don't do anything in a hurry. They're just somewhat complacent. Have you visited some churches that are like that? Uh, maybe they're dead and nobody's just preached the funeral yet, it seems like. They seem to just exist. And they're there maybe just to gather and to worship, and that's a good thing to do. But they've forgotten that they have a mission to do, that we have a work to do. A man gave me his business card one day, and on the back of that card it said, the main thing is to always keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> right? I like that. And I'd add, I said, that's the main thing, isn't it? <laughs> so the main thing is to always keep the main thing the main thing. We can get sidetracked from the main thing. 
The great thing about the autonomy of the Lord's church is this. When I say autonomy, I mean we're not connected together by any denominational ties. We don't have an earthly headquarters. The head of this church is Jesus Christ. There are elders who are overseers of it. And you're not connected to another church through some denominational organization. Each congregation of the church of Christ, you see, is autonomous or self-governing. That's by God's design, Acts 14, 23. He ordained that there should be elders, plural, in every or each church. And so those elders, if you will, superintend or oversee the work that's going on. That means if church A over here departs from the faith, church B does not have to follow it. And so if another congregation then is not fulfilling its mission, that doesn't mean that this congregation cannot fulfill its mission, you see. And so this church has a mission to accomplish. You and I have mission, a mission to accomplish. It's not our work. It's not something we dreamed up, if you will, but it's something that God has given us to do. Consequently then, let us resolve to be about our Father's business. If you look at Jesus Christ, you'll always see him not getting sidetracked from doing what God intended him to do. If you look at the Apostle Paul, you'll find him not getting sidetracked from what God intended him to do. I read another statement that a preacher made one time. It said that, he said, you know, I've been so busy doing the church work, I haven't had time to do the Lord's work. <laughs> well, the church work is the Lord's work. But if we aren't careful, we can do everything. That is, we start things up and doing things that are really not the work of the church, but we enjoy doing them and somebody's got to be over them and our hands get tied up in doing things except what the Lord intended us to do. I read somewhere the other day again about a whale that died chasing minnows. It got sidetracked. It was going after some larger game, but some smaller fish came by and it went out after those smaller fish chasing those and of course it could get up into the shallows that is those smaller fish could and that whale it got up there and got beached and died and so they wrote an article about it said he died chasing minnows sometimes we can get that way in life we get sidetracked from what the main purpose is and if we're not careful we get beached over there uh, on the uh, on the do nothing uh, as it said and and we get sidetracked from it so let's ask first of all, or, or note first of all, what is not the Lord's mission? What is not the Lord's mission? What is not really the work of the church then? Number one, the church is not a social club. Now I know there's a social aspect of the church. I understand that. But it's not for the social elite. It's not designed to just fulfill Billy Bland's wants. What do you have to offer me is the idea. Why do people join social clubs? Well, there may be some sort of a prestige that goes with that. Or it might be something they think that they're going to get out of that. And so they join this. And you know what happens is if things don't go their way, they quit the club, don't they? Because it's all about them and what they want. And they disagreed with something. And consequently then they jump ship when it doesn't go their way. Now I know their Bible is filled with such things as fellow soldiers, uh, fellow servants, and we're, there's a lot of Bible fellows, if you will, in there. There is that uh, communion that we have, that fellowship that we have, which is a social aspect of it, but it's not a social elite club. Secondly, the church of Christ is not a recreational institution. It is not the work of the church to provide recreation for my children or my grandchildren. Again, I, I have types of recreation that I like, and I guess you have the kind that you like. But if we aren't careful, there are churches that seem to focus in on doing just recreation. I know of some that spend more on a gymnasium on the electricity than they do in mission work because an elder told me they did. It costs them more to keep up their basketball gymnasium out there than it does uh, than what they spend in trying to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. I've jokingly said before, if we're going to have a Church of Christ baseball team, 
I'd rather have a Church of Christ bass fishing tournament. And I'd like for the church to buy me a boat. I'll go pick it out. I'll do all the legwork. And I'll write on the side of it if you want to make it scriptural. See, here is water. <laughs> Acts chapter 8. I might even baptize somebody, you see, when I got them out there. And so you see, I, I think we got it all wrong. Not playing baseball. Uh, well, I'm not against playing softball, baseball, and badminton, or whatever else you want to play. Uh, I'm not against bass fishing or whatever other kind of fishing we want to do, but I don't expect the church to buy me a boat. I don't expect the church to put us into those. But if members of the church want to get together and go do that, that's great. That's wonderful. But it's not doing the work of the church, you see, and, and so doing. But some churches have gotten so into that that many times uh, because they want to use that as a tool to draw the people into them. One way they'll do it is they will say, you can be on our team, but you have to attend X number of services. Well, that's gimmickry, isn't it? My friend, Christ didn't die for me to use gimmickry to try to get people to love him. I like what an older preacher said. He said, the gospel is God's drawing power. And if the gospel does not draw one, well, then that person's not worthy of the drawing. We don't trick people into the church of Christ. We want people to understand what they're doing when they become a member of the church. That's why we try to set up Bible studies and, and say, here is what the Bible says. We're trying to find people who are interested in studying their Bibles. We're not selling you religion. We're not putting out gimmickry. Back in the 70s and maybe the 80s, that was a time when people went into all sorts of gimmickry. They would put a $10 bill under the seat, and if somebody sat at that seat, they got that $10. Uh, one preacher said he'd swallow a live goldfish. If they got a certain attendance to come, uh, reach that, I'm not going to swallow a lot. Now, you put a little... Uh, uh, breading on him and put him in some grease, we might be talking, but I'm not going to do it to get people to come to church, but, you know, one of them would ride a bicycle up and down the aisle. I wrote an article one time, and, and uh, I said, if you're going to get somebody that's going to act like a clown, call him a clown, but don't call him a gospel preacher. Now, again, recreation is good, but that's not the work of the church per se. I never grew up thinking that it was the church's responsibility to provide that recreation for me. Now, we have a lot of young people. You have a lot of children here, and that's a wonderful thing. And there's a lot of activities that our young people are doing, but you know who's doing it? One of our deacons who has little children. We're not paying him to do it. He wants to, and if they want to get together, if they want to camp out, that's a wonderful thing. They do that. They, they set those things up, but they're not looking to the church to go buy them tents and call it a Church of Christ tent or whatever. Uh, they may get together and do all sorts of things. And that's a good thing. We should associate with one another, but it's not the work of the church to provide recreation. Don't misunderstand now. But here's what I would suggest. Churches who hire youth ministers for the sole purpose of becoming a recreational director, need to rethink what is the work of that man that they have working with the youth. And I'm certainly not opposed with the church having a younger man, if that's what they need. If you've got enough young people, if they want to have a man on staff who's working primarily with the younger people, that's fine. But let's do the work of the church. And not only that, I don't sell our young people short. I think they've got enough sense to know they don't have to be entertained to be uh, children of God. You know, we think that we've got to entertain them in some way or else we're going to lose them. Friends, we need to preach the gospel to them, don't we? And uh, they'll understand the gospel and, and they've got uh, a lot of good uh, learning about them. It's not the purpose of the church in the third place to, pro to provide a political platform for various politics. Now, you know our country uh, has been politically divided for a number of years, I suppose. And I know that when I go to the poll, I'm still a Christian and I'm gonna vote to the best of my ability based on Christian principles. Consequently, I will be voting for the man who is going to help 
the uh, America, if you will, to the best of my uh, best of his ability, to become what he should, what America should be. But it's, and I can preach on morals, and I can preach on things of that nature, but I'm not going to set up here and start endorsing particular candidates, you see, and say the Church of Christ is getting behind Mr. So-and-so or whatever. I have an idea if you dig deep enough, you're going to find some things in most any of those candidates <laughs> that you're going to say the church ought not to be endorsing that, right? But, and so if we're not careful, though, the churches get into that and then they start boycotting or they start to, So it, it gets it away from what the... You remember the main thing is to keep the main thing what? The main thing. And so it's not just a social club. You know, people have called before, and I remember Brother Bill Jackson years ago when he said somebody, a lady I believe it was, called and said, what do you have to offer my children if we come there and place membership? He said, I wanted to ask her, maybe said he did, what do you have to offer us if we accept you into membership? You see, it's not a social club. And when the elders at Coldwater meet with somebody who's placing membership, we go over some things and we tell them some work we're doing and we tell them we want you to be a part of that. We don't want you to come here and just occupy a pew. We want you to be a, be a worker, you see, in the kingdom of God and doing the work that he's given us to do. So when we open up the pages of the New Testament, we do not read the church involved in the things that we've just discussed. But now then, for the short time that we have remaining, what is the work of the church? We've seen what it is not. What is the work of the church? Well, friends, we glorify God in the church. Ephesians 3, 10 and 11 says, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundant above all that we ask or think, unto him be glory in the church throughout all ages, world without end, and he adds the word amen. I am glorifying God in the church. I work through the church doing the work of God in order to glorify God. Not to glorify us, not to glorify me, but to glorify God. That is going to, in all of our works, that's what we're going to do. You see the church, now think about what the church is. The church, according to 1 Timothy 3.15, is the pillar and ground of the truth. Now what does that mean? The function of the church is to uphold the truth and to support the truth. Okay? Now then I'm getting into what the work of the church is. I'm glorifying God by upholding His truth. There needs to be a refuge for people who are looking for truth. There needs to be that refuge for people who are looking out here at the world and they're seeing this world's going to leave you stranded. This world's going to leave you empty. Is there not some place where somebody is taking a stand for moral rightness and truth and back it up with a thus saith the Lord? Yes. And that's what the church of Christ in a community ought to be. One that is standing for the truth. So the work of the church, friends, first of all, is evangelism. The work of the church is evangelism. Among the very last words that Jesus ever stated, just before he went to heaven, was this. All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. There's the marching orders for the church. That's what we're to be involved in. We're seeking to get the gospel out worldwide, not only to every nation, but friends, to every creature, Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Then he says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And so we're going to teach and to preach. Did you know the imperative in the original in both of those passages is not go. Oh, I used to say we're commanded to go. Well, we are, but that's not the imperative. The imperative is teach. The imperative is preach. Now, it could be translated this way. As you are going, teach. As you are going, preach. You see, people can go and not teach or preach and still not fulfill the mission of Christ. 
a uh, young man called me one time and said, Brother Bland, I'd like to go on a mission trip with you. <laughs> well, I might I'd like for you to go someday. But he said, I, I've never been overseas. And I thought, you need a travel agent. You don't need, a, you don't need me. I'm not interested in giving somebody a tour <laughs> of some place. Our mission is to go and teach and preach. Now, I enjoy travel, uh, and I enjoy seeing the sights. Uh, you know, it does get a little old. I made 21 trips above the Arctic Circle. And when you're preaching in, uh, in Murmansk, Russia, and you have no heat, and it's 30 below zero outside, I don't need a, I might have should, I might have should have booked a tour guide, I don't know. But there's a lady that came three hours and 30 below zero that evening. She rode one, uh, two hours on a trolley and walked around one hour trying to find us in Kola, Russia, K-O-L-A, because she read we were giving away Bibles and she had never had a Bible. And I find that's dedication, isn't it? We could go right down here to probably a dollar store or Walmart or something and get a Bible. But over there at first, they didn't have Bibles and things of that nature. But anyway, our mission then is to go and teach. The church in the first century took this charge very seriously. Even when people came along and said, you can't teach anymore. You can't preach anymore in the name of Jesus Christ. People say, what are we going to do if the government shuts us down? Friends, the government's not going to shut us down. They may try to shut us up, but that's not going to work because we're going to go. But what if they put a sword to your neck? We're still going to preach the word. That's what they did in the first century. Someone has said then that, you know, kicking the church in the first century was like kicking the fire. All it did was spread, it spread it. You go in and start kicking a fire out there. If you're camping out, I wouldn't recommend that. But uh, because some of it might stick to you. And, uh, but at any rate, <clears throat> that's the way it was in the first century. The more they kicked the church, the faster it spread. The more disciples they put to death, they said that the more people obeyed the gospel and people took courage of that. You find the church then being preached and uh, the gospel being preached in Jerusalem by the church. You find that then it went on up into Samaria. Ultimately, it goes on up into Antioch of Syria. If you're going up uh, on the map there a little bit, and the church at Antioch of Syria receives message from God, from the Holy Spirit, to separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work whereunto I have sent them. And now then they go on those three great missionary journeys. And what are they doing? Preaching and teaching. They're going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. Churches worked together in the first century to do that, even though they were autonomous. The church in Philippi sent once and again to Paul's necessity. He said, not because I desire to give, but that fruit might be born to your account. He said, I've learned whatsoever state I'm in, therewith to be content. But these churches then all work together to order, in order to support Paul and others to go and preach the gospel unto every creature. In fact, he said to the Corinthian church, I robbed other churches to do you service. And so he says, I took that support in order to preach the gospel. Now, how successful were they in the first century? Well, Colossians 1.23 says, If you continue in the word, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which was preached to every creature, under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Now we look at that and we say, really? We just have a hard time believing that. You mean they took the gospel to every creature under heaven? Well, let's read it again and see. If ye continue in the word, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. I believe it's every creature. How'd they do that? They didn't have telephones. They didn't have telegraphs. They didn't have bullet trains. They didn't have airplanes. They didn't have internet and every, all these other things. But you know what they had? They had dedication and they had motivation. And they were preaching the gospel. Wherever the apostle Paul went, he either had a revival or a riot. <laughs> you had to be dedicated if you went with the apostle Paul. 
I, I cannot imagine. I, I think about old Timothy when, when Paul says to Timothy, I want you to travel with me. Well, Timothy, where are you from? I'm from Lystra. What happened in Lystra? That's where Paul was stoned and left for dead, drug out of the city. They thought he was dead. He gets up, goes back into Lystra. It's amazing. And then he continues on preaching. Why, in Damascus, they had to put him in a basket, lay him down over the wall because they were uh, going to kill him. Why? Preaching the gospel. But he kept on preaching the gospel. Friends with the Apostle Paul, you think about if we had more people like him. If you let him go, he's out here evangelizing the world. If you chain him to a guard, he's trying to convert the jailer. Can you imagine being chained to a preacher? <laughs> well, and especially if he's like Paul. If you put him in jail, he basically writes the Bible. He just keeps on working. Why, they put him in his own hired house up there in Rome, you remember, while he was waiting trial. And what did he do? Well, people started coming to him. And he taught from morning to evening, teaching the kingdom of God. Later on, he'd talk about those in Caesar's household. That's amazing, isn't it? And they said, Paul, if you don't stop it, we're going to kill you. He said, I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. How do you stop a man like that? Well, that's why I think they could say that they took the gospel. That's just the Apostle Paul. There were others. You know, I'm so grateful to men in the past who have sacrificed much and labored hard in order to preach the gospel. We need to be teaching our young people. That's the reason why, friends, we need to recognize the work of the church is not just mere entertainment or not entertainment, but rather training them the gospel so that they can be teaching others as they grow up themselves, you see. We need congregations, friend, who are looking for men and works to support I believe, and I teach in a course on world, well, I teach a whole section of world evangelism, and I, I look for material on church planting. Not many of our brethren have anything on that. Why? I wonder why that is. Did you know on one of my trips back from overseas, I was flying from Seattle back to uh, Memphis, and I was sitting beside a denominational preacher, and this denominational preacher told me, he said, I've been out to Seattle to explain what we're doing in Memphis. He said in Memphis, the church that they are there in Memphis is a huge church there in Memphis, denominational church. He said, we have plans to establish 11 new churches this year. That's what this church wants to do, he's telling me. Well, there's a particular denomination of the same as of which they are in, out in Seattle. And they wanted uh, him to come out and explain to them so that they might have that same zip. So I'm looking here and I get to thinking, what are we doing? What are our plans about church planting? That is, of taking the gospel into places where the church does not exist and they are preaching. There are cities that have over a million people in them and the church does not exist. Isn't that sad? That's sad. But we can change that. Because the Lord has told us to go all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. The Lord has said, go and teach all nations. Now, I know God has never given us anything that's an impossibility to do. So I know we can do it. And I'm grateful for men who are doing it. So the work of the church is evangelism. Also, the work of the church is edification. What we're doing here tonight, friends, is the work of the church. So you're helping to fulfill that work. From the time that one enters into the kingdom, he needs to grow. Or she needs to grow. God wants us to grow and be strong. I've said in Bible classes, and, and, and I get just a little short of patience with people who have been in the church ever since the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they say, I've got a question. Or I want to play the devil's advocate. And then they come up with some far-fetched idea that they should have learned within a month of being a child of God. But they are older, and now then they haven't grown. They haven't grown. Did you know just because you get older in age doesn't mean you have matured in the faith, right? And, and consequently then we need to be growing. God wants us to be strong, brethren. Not weak. The church of Christ ought to be strong. 
not weak. Ephesians 6, 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 16, 13, he says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men, be strong. You think about the messengers that God has sent out. He sent Moses before, I call him Osama ben Pharaoh. All right, I don't know what his name was, and I'm sure it wasn't Osama. But, it, but here's old Pharaoh who could have probably had him killed. And you know what Moses, what he did not say? He didn't say, now God has told me that if you don't mind, it sure would be help us if, if you just, you know, let us go. That's not the way he said it to Pharaoh, was it? I mean, this man went before the, uh, the king, Pharaoh, and said, Thus saith the Lord, let my people go. Pharaoh says, I know not the Lord, neither will I let him go. Moses basically says, well, God's going to give you ten visual aids to help you understand who the Lord is. And by the time it's through, he's begging Moses to take them out of Egypt. You see, you look at Jeremiah standing strong. You look at John the Baptist standing strong. Look at Jesus Christ standing strong. God wants us to be strong, not apologizing for the truth, not hoping somebody surely doesn't bring up a Bible question because I might not know the answer. God wants us to be strong. We need to be edified then. Now, how do we grow in strength? First of all, friends, desire it. We shouldn't have to be force-fed, Right? We should desire it. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. I, I need to be studying the word of God, not just reading it out of rote, as it were, or reading it out of a sense of duty that now I've got to read a chapter and things of that nature. No, I, I'm studying and I get involved in it. I can remember years ago, back before the days of using the computers, and I used a lot of different books. I looked around one day because I was developing a sermon and I had this book, you know, and all, all about one word. And I just looked around and I thought, man, this, this is amazing. The, the Bible is so rich. The Bible is so rich if we would get into studying it. Let me encourage you to do that if you're not already. So we need to desire it. Then leadership needs to provide opportunities for growth, such as gospel meetings like we're having here. You know, the elders of this congregation obviously want you to grow because they've set up this gospel meeting with a time and now also this theme, what is right with the church. Now, why do we do this? So that we might be strengthened, so that these young people, after this week that we've had, know something about the church and know something that's right about the church. Then you can have lectureships. You can have vacation Bible schools. You can have special classes and things of that nature, which you're doing. All of these opportunities, avail ourselves then of these opportunities. Then finally, the work of the church also is benevolence. That is, we are genuinely interested in trying to help those who need to be helped. Now, I don't think it's the work of the church to encourage laziness. <laughs> that is, if a man doesn't work, what did Paul say? Neither should he eat. So I, I'm not saying that we need to try to in some way encourage laziness, but at the same time, there are people who need help, financial help. They need food. They need uh, guidance. It's hard to teach the gospel to somebody if they're very hungry. And so I think we need that. We can basically put all those together as far as that goes. Edification and benevolence in with evangelism as far as that goes. But Galatians 6.10, Paul, uh, Paul says, As you have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. In Acts chapter 2, when all of the people had come together and they're staying now in Jerusalem, they, were, they ran out of uh, necessities. And so what did the members of the church do? They began to sell their properties. They began to sell off. They began to liquidate, if you will, in order to give to those who had need. Now, notice they didn't give to everybody's wants, but they gave to everybody's needs, right? And so it is then the work of the church is involved in it. I find the church doing that. In fact, I find James 1.27 says this, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So there's some fatherless people out here. 
through no fault of their own. They've entered into this world and they don't have parents. Well, they have them, but unfortunately, you know, we don't have many orphans homes anymore. That may surprise us. We have children's homes. Why do we not have orphan homes? It's because the parents are alive. It's just they're on drugs and they're in trouble and they're in jail. And so I know of a congregation in Memphis, a good congregation uh, in uh, city uh, downtown Memphis area. And he, they cook a full breakfast every Sunday morning and they feed a lot of the children. And then uh, I think they stay for church service. But he, one of the uh, brothers told me, he said, Brother Bland, this may be the only good meal that they have all week because they don't know their father and the mother's out, on, out at night doing whatever. And so he said, we're trying to save this community, and so that's what they're doing. I think that's a good work to do as they're trying to reach those people with the gospel of Christ. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and keep oneself unspotted from the world. I challenge you to uh, look at a video. I showed it to two of the secretaries the other day. It's hard for me to watch it without crying. There's this little boy, and what has happened is, and you may have seen the video, but it's like a, a drill sergeant is yelling at this little boy. What has happened is this little boy had been in trouble. They sent him over to boot camp to try to get him straightened out. In other words, he needed some authoritative figure to whip him into shape, so to speak. And when it comes back, is now he's about to turn him back over to his mother, and he's on a TV show. And this man is saying, you see that woman right over there? Yes, sir. That's your mother. You understand that? Yes, sir. I understand that. He said, now, you listen to her and you obey her or else I'm going to be your daddy. He said, you don't want me to be your daddy, do you? He said, yes, sir. He said, what? <laughs> he didn't know what to say because he had been on him like a drill sergeant all this week. He said, you don't want me to be your daddy, do you? He said, Yes, sir. Thought he misunderstood it. He said, son, why do you want me to be your daddy? He said, because I don't have a daddy. You know what that little boy did? He, he respected authority. And he said, and I think the man kind of broke down because he put his arm around him and they walked off the stage. If you'll, as a lady said one time, gargle that. <laughs> Google it. <laughs> if you will, uh, Google. Uh, on YouTube, you go to YouTube. And you say, little boy is asked, do you want me to be your daddy? And you can watch that. But I thought, how many of the little children out there who need guidance? Part of the work of the church is to visit. That means to take care of, to help those children who are in need. So yes, the church is authorized to do that. Time and again, contributions were sent to the church in Jerusalem to assist brethren who were in need. Not just one time, but many times. In, fi in fact, Paul worked basically a year trying to bring, get up the, uh, the needs. And it's not restricted to Christians only. The church can help those who are outside the church, like little children. Galatians 6 and verse number 10. Jesus and God the Father, you know, they make the sun to rise on the just and on the unjust, don't they? They send rain on the just and the unjust. And then he tells us to have the same spirit as the Father. So I think the church obviously can do what God the Father does to help them materially if that's what they need. So what is the work of the church? Evangelism, edification, and benevolence. And there's enough of that in all of those areas that need to be done that we don't have to get sidetracked. We can keep the main thing the main thing. But here again... Since we are Christians, members of the church of Christ, the church's mission is our mission. You see, that brings it down to me now. We've looked at it as a, as a whole, as it were. But that's my mission, isn't it? My mission is to help take that gospel to everyone. My mission is to help edify one another. My mission is to be benevolent toward those who are in need also. Did you know that the world's population is over 7 billion people now? That's a lot of folks. In China, there's about 1.5 billion people. In India, there's about 1.3 billion. I said in India, the only way to have privacy is to close your eyes. I was over there and there's so many people. 
<laughs> I think one fellow said, there's not even enough room to change your mind over here. <laughs> there are so many people in this world. In America, there's only about, well, I haven't looked up the figures lately, but it was 300 million. So back when India was 1.3, we are that 0.3. In other words, India has a billion people more than what we have. So we've got a task ahead of us of preaching the gospel. We have, a, we have a great opportunity. We have a limited time. You know, Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Time's going to run out on us on one of these days as an individual. There's a generation coming along behind us. Maybe we, if we will change and we'll start doing the work that God wants us to do, that we'll train them now, that they will take up that sword after we have gone on if we've laid the sword down they'll pick it right back up and keep it going that's what we ought that's what ought to happen but friends that's why you need to be a christian you don't need to be a christian just to go to heaven oh that's a great reason but you need to be a christian so that you can be involved in the greatest work in the world don't wait until it's too late uh, but rather obey the gospel now if you're here this evening you've heard the word of god you believe that jesus is the christ the son of god why not repent of any sin that might be in your life? Confess the sweet name of Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins. You'll be glad you did. The Lord will add you to his church. Now you've got a mission. You've got a purpose. You've got a function to do in the greatest work in the world. If you're an erring member of the body of Christ and you know you are, God knows you are. You want to come back, we'll pray with you and, God, and we'll pray for you. God will restore you and you can get back again to be involved in the Lord's work. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we bid you to come. Together we stand, we sing this song. I am resolved.